Hi, hello, welcome to the Physionic, or welcome back to the Physionic podcast. My name is Nicholas Verhoeven. I'm a PhD candidate in molecular medicine and uh, have a background in exercise physiology and nutrition. And today we're going to be discussing a particular study that I thought, actually, I had covered this paper uh, before in a short form video format. And uh, but then I realized I never actually went back and did the whole podcast episode where I go into extreme detail with all of the data and kind of explain more on the mechanisms and things like that. So I thought, why not take this opportunity to discuss a paper on intermittent fasting? So this paper is from the Journal of Translational Medicine, and it's called Effects of Eight Weeks of Time-Restricted Feeding, so intermittent fasting, uh, 16-8 style on basal metabolism, maximal strength, body composition, inflammation, and cardiovascular risk factors in resistance-trained males. So this is applicable to people who exercise uh, and applicable to men. Uh, it may also be applicable to women as well, but of course we, we would need uh, independent studies to, to verify that. But I imagine that, I, honestly, just based off of what I know uh, from other studies is that I would say a lot of the results that end up coming out of the study are applicable to women as well. So uh, essentially the study investigates the impact of a 16-8, so uh, what's known as a lean gains approach, 16 hours of fasting, eight hours of uh, consumption window, uh, of intermittent fasting has on body fat, muscle mass, inflammation, insulin, and blood sugar, as well as a few other markers, but those are kind of the big ones that I wanted to really focus on. <clears throat> so if you're not familiar with what intermittent fasting is, just a really, really brief overview. Uh, intermittent fasting is essentially where you just don't eat for X amount of time throughout a day. Uh, it's typically restricted to within a day, although you have certain variations that extend beyond a day, like uh, eat, stop, eat, where you don't eat at all for 24 hours, then you eat for 24 hours, et cetera, et cetera. You keep going through that pattern. Uh, the There's other ones like OMAD, uh, or which is very familiar with uh, the warrior diet. Uh, so 22, roughly 22 hours of fasting and then like two hours of consumption, or you just essentially just have one massive meal. Uh, that's another type of intermittent fasting. And then you have less severe, quote unquote, less severe, but certainly extremely popular, probably among the most popular is the 16 hour fasting window and then eight hours of food consumption. What most people do for that is they, of course, incorporate their sleep into that. So preferably around eight hours of sleep. So that cuts into the 16 hours that leaves you with eight hours left. And then from there, people typically uh, either skip breakfast and then uh, push their, their lunch to, let's say, like 2 p.m. or something along those lines. And then they can consume until like 8, 10 p.m., uh, that that particular day and then you sleep and you redo the the whole cycle <clears throat> so that's what uh, we're going to be investigating in this particular study so intermittent fasting has of course been associated with uh has been shown in the past to improve cholesterol uh, reduce insulin and reduce blood pressure according to these researchers and it's also believed to occur uh, these effects are specific to lipolysis and autophagy. And I'm not going to be going into autophagy and lipolysis all that much in this podcast, mainly because I've, I've touched on them in the past, and that's really not the focus of this particular podcast. In this uh, podcast, I will be touching on some other mechanisms related to, uh, if you're familiar with the hormone, adiponectin. So I'm going to be going into the mechanisms of adiponectin on uh, mitochondria and on fat loss and things like that. So uh, that stay tuned till the end after the data for me to kind of explain that. And this is all based off of what the researchers of this particular study uh, wanted to kind of point out because there's a particular anomaly in this study that uh, I have my interpretation of what I think is actually going on. And then they provided another interpretation. So I'll go ahead and offer both of them and then you can make up your own mind. Okay, so a bit on the study design before we actually jump into the data. Uh, and the study design is 34 resistance trained men were recruited or ultimately used in the study. So they split them up into two groups, 17 and 17. That makes 34. Look at that math. Uh, 
And so 17 were put into an intermittent fasting condition or group. And the other 17 were told to maintain their normal diet. So they did not have to restrict their eating window or anything along those lines. Uh, the intermittent fasting group consumed all of their food between around 1 p.m. and 8 p.m. And they did so for eight weeks. The normal dieting condition, which if you're watching the podcast, you'll see when I show some of the data, ND is normal dieting, meaning normal diet, meaning that they just stuck to their regular routine that they've always done. And they got some counseling from nutritionists and dietitians as well, but they were put on a uh, weight maintenance protocol. So uh, they were instructed to essentially just continue eating the foods that you normally eat. Just make sure that you eat within this realm of, of food consumption. And all the participants had to have been weightlifting for at least five years. And they had to have some experience with a split routine training technique, which is really simple. You have full body and you have split routine. Uh, full body is just as it sounds. If you're exercising, if you're weightlifting, you train every part of your body. You do chest, you do shoulders, you do arms, back, legs, et cetera, et cetera, uh, all in one session. A uh, split routine would be splitting particular body parts up. So one day you would do chest and shoulders, and then another day you would do back and arms, you know, things like that, and you're splitting them up. So that's what they, they did for, for this particular uh, study. I don't think it's going to make a huge dramatic difference, but for some reason they decided to go with the split routine. So the split, if you're interested, is that they split it up between chest and biceps on one day, uh, shoulders and legs on another day, and then back and triceps on another day. So three day split. And they did one to two exercises per muscle group with typically two exercises for the larger muscle groups like chest and legs and things like that and back. And then usually around one exercise for, let's say, like the biceps or triceps. And the study lasted for eight weeks in total. Uh, if you feel like that's sufficient time or not sufficient time, that might be a potential weakness of the study. The fact that it's only eight weeks, I mean, two months is a decent amount of time. Uh, I think that you would likely see some some changes in these uh, different measures that they end up looking at, like cholesterol, blood sugar, things like that. That's not going to take two months for it to, to show itself. But uh, maybe in other areas, you might uh, feel like they didn't do this study for long enough. Maybe it should have been 12 weeks or 24 weeks, something along those lines. But as it stands, they did it for eight weeks. And before I forget, uh, also they trained three times a week. So they did each uh, split three or uh, one time. And then they did uh, three sets per exercise for six to eight repetitions per exercise to near failure. So around 90%, 85, 90% of one rep max, if you're familiar with all that terminology. The point is they uh, push themselves pretty hard, at least per session. Okay, so now that said, let's jump into a bit of the data. If you are watching the podcast, I will of course have a few of the pieces of data up on the screen. I'm not gonna have all of them because they had a long list of different things that they tested. Ultimately, they took blood samples and they also took measurements and they also took DEXA scans. So let me start from that back end. DEXA scan is essentially just a scan of the body to measure uh, body fat percentage or body fat total amount of body fat as well as uh, muscle mass. And they're able to tell if they see decreases in muscle size, for example. So that was one measure. Then they did anthropometric measures, which are like uh, your body weight, things like that, or your girth. Uh, so they did that as well. And then finally, they did blood measurements to actually figure out uh, if there were changes in these different hormones. We're going to be discussing leptin, adiponectin, uh, interleukin-6, which isn't necessarily a hormone, but it's uh, more attributed to an inflammatory uh, signal or uh, molecule. They also test testosterone, IGF-1, things like that, insulin. So they did a lot of different measures that are based on these blood parameters. So they took blood measurements before each of these participants were on their designed diet and before the actual study like truly began. And then they took it again eight weeks later. And they compared within, this, within the group, so the intermittent fasting group was compared against itself itself 
uh, at the, from the beginning of the study to the end of the study. And they also, and the same thing with for the normal diet group, and then they compared between subjects. So comparing the intermittent fasting changes to the normal diet changes and wanted to see the difference between those. Is there a significant difference? So let us go ahead and jump into this. Again, I'm not covering all of the data, but I will have the paper for you uh, if you're interested in looking, f looking at that data for yourself as well as my notes and things like that uh, as usual. So the first thing is to look at fat-free mass. Fat-free mass is just as it sounds. It's literally anything, muscle, bone, uh, collagen, et cetera, et cetera, that isn't fat. Simple as that. Uh, there is no change between the two conditions. So if that's intermittent fasting or uh, normal diet, both of those groups had no changes in fat-free mass. Uh, however, this first piece of data is actually pretty intriguing. And essentially, they looked at body fat and they actually found that with their, with the intermittent fasting group, there was a loss in body fat. Not dramatic, dramatic, but a, a pretty modest loss, but that was still statistically significant in uh, loss of body fat. However, the normal diet group did not see a loss in body fat. So there tended to be then a statistically significant difference between the two groups, meaning that intermittent fasting led to a loss of body fat, which was not apparent in the other condition. Now, how much did they lose? Uh, I didn't do the math exactly, but it was like around one and a half kilograms, so around 3.3 pounds of body fat, something along those lines. So pretty interesting to, to start out. Now, the next thing that they wanted to look at was muscle strength and muscle size, which I told you was uh, measured by the DEXA scan. Uh, however, with muscle strength, obviously they're doing something like a one rep max in, in like the exercise itself, uh, the bench press, leg press, things like that, which were some of the exercises that they ended up implementing um, in, in this study. And here, there's really nothing too, too crazy to report. There was no change. So if the the individuals were on in, in an intermittent fasting diet or if uh, they were on the normal diet, uh, it didn't matter. Um, there were no decreases or increases or statistically significant increases or decreases in the muscle size or, and that's with the arm or the thigh, so the leg, or in strength. So no differences between the two groups and no differences within the groups either. So at least what we can take away from that is that at least with intermittent fasting, people are so afraid that uh, you'll essentially cat catabolize muscle that you'll end up losing muscle over time. And in all reality, it seems like that's, that's rather unfounded. At least when you are not trying to drop body fat, when you're not trying, that's the key word here, trying to drop body fat. Because again, the researchers weren't trying to have these people uh, lose body fat. It just so happened that the intermittent fasting group did lose a little bit of body fat. So what can we take away from this ultimately is that the intermittent fasting group will not see decrements in their strength or their muscle size if they are consuming an equicaloric amount. Now, there's going to be some nuance I'm going to uh, attach to that uh, near the end of the podcast, but still, that's still pretty interesting. And you could certainly critique at this point, well, the study was only eight weeks. So maybe if we'd done it for 24 weeks, maybe we have, would have seen an effect. Do I think so? No, I don't. Uh, I don't think that the change is sufficient. Maybe if you went out years into the future, maybe you might have a small difference, but it would be really negligible. Okay, so the next thing is to look at adipin, ad, adiponectin. And uh, you may or may not be familiar with this already from previous podcasts or from other education that you've had, but adiponectin is what's considered an adipokine or uh, also a fat hormone, meaning that it is secreted from your fat cells. And 
it's typically secreted and leads to greater insulin sensitivity. So it has a beneficial effect in terms of blood sugar regulation and insulin sensitivity, and both of those being very closely tied together. And interestingly here, they found that again, with the intermittent fasting group, there was an increase in adiponectin that was seen within the groups and also between the groups. So when comparing the before intermittent fasting to the after intermittent fasting, within that same group, there was an effect, there was an increase in adiponectin, but then when they compared that to the normal diet group, that effect also was, uh, was prevalent, was uh, associated there. So that means that intermittent fasting then increases this, adip these, this release of circulating adiponectin hormone, or at least uh, reduces its de degradation. Really, I'm getting into the weeds there, but ultimately the point is that there's higher levels of adiponectin with the intermittent fasting group. And it has a series of different effects, but we're gonna be focused on the kind of the insulin effects and also the, uh, the effects that it can have on mitochondria and, and fat use and things like that. So interesting here, very interesting. Now, the other thing that they looked at, which I won't show any data for, uh, but again, not like I'm trying to hide anything. I'll have the paper link so you can look for it for yourself. I just didn't want to constantly be throwing up a bunch of graphics of just numbers. Just keep throwing them up there. Uh, so because it can get overwhelming and then people are like, well, I, I don't want to do this work. So I'm out, uh, which would be unfortunate. So the other one that they looked at, which is another adipokine, another uh, fat secreted hormone is leptin. And leptin did decrease with intermittent fasting, which is uh, interesting because typically leptin decreases when you're in a caloric deficit. We will address that later on. Uh, and other ones that they looked at were different inflammatory markers, molecules, cytokines, known as interleukin-6, tumor necrosis factor alpha, they also looked at, I believe, interleukin-1 beta. So all of these are inflammatory or related to inf inflammation. So increasing, modulating, usually increasing uh, inflammation, meaning more immune cell recruitment. And that has its positives and it certainly has its negatives as I've discussed in the past. But in this situation, kind of generally, basally speaking, you probably don't want to, ha to have a ton of inflammation going on. So what was interesting is that with uh, a lot, several of these measures that with the intermittent fasting group, again, there was a decrease in these inflammatory markers, which was not seen in the normal dieting condition. Next was testosterone, which I do have the, uh, the data for that. So with testosterone, obviously, I probably don't need to go too much into this, but testosterone is obviously very helpful for a number of different biological factors, uh, especially growth, maintenance of muscle, things like that, uh, maintenance of all kinds of different tissues, actually, not just muscle. And they found that there was no effect of the normal diet. However, there was an effect in the intermittent fasting diet and not in the direction that most people want it to go. Uh, it actually decreased. So intermittent fast in the in intermittent fasting group, there was a uh, decrease in testosterone and normal diet group, there was no decrease in testosterone. So something to keep in mind. Uh, why that might be the case, again, I'll be addressing that a little bit later on. Another one that they looked at was IGF-1, so insulin-like growth factor, which is also implicated with uh, growth hormone and testosterone. And they found that much like testosterone, the intermittent fasting group saw decreases in IGF-1. So Again, we're, we're kind of seeing a trend, and a lot of these things are actually pretty familiar to other research that I've seen. Um, is that a good thing, bad thing? Just hold on to your bias for the time being. We're going to address some of this stuff uh, later on. Insulin was it decreased with intermittent fasting. So that might be a good thing, right? Maybe there's increased insulin sensitivity as a result, and therefore you need uh, the pancreas needs to release less insulin as a whole could be a benefit. So intermittent fasting would potentially help in that regard. Uh, cholesterol was largely unaffected. However, uh, HDL cholesterol, high density lipoprotein cholesterol did increase slightly and it was statistically significant for that as well. Uh, blood sugar. I forgot that I didn't 
write any notes on this, but it doesn't really matter. Uh, the blood sugar did decrease as well with intermittent fasting. So this actually kind of supplies further into this adiponectin and insulin uh, hypothesis or kind of thought process in general that with you, you're seeing decreases in uh, insulin circulating insulin levels with intermittent fasting, and you're seeing decreases in blood sugar. It's kind of those correlating together. Uh, having a direct relationship, that means then that it's potential that you have higher insulin sensitivity. You have less molecules of insulin necessary to push more blood sugar into the cells, therefore removing blood sugar out of the bloodstream. So, and that was only seen with the intermittent fasting group. Uh, however, that is not necessarily seen in terms of the comparison to the normal diet group. So uh, it was only seen when comparing the intermittent fasting group at the beginning and then at the end. However, there was no effect when compared to the normal dieting group. Now imagine this is another instance where maybe, maybe if they had continued doing this, that maybe they would have seen an effect after 12 weeks or 16 weeks, something along those lines. It may be a more mild effect, but there may be an effect there regardless. Okay, triglycerides, so blood fats, were also decreased with intermittent fasting. Uh, another one that's really interesting to a lot of people is metabolism. Uh, resting energy expenditure, so resting metabolism, not talking about when you're being physically active or spontaneous activity and things like that, that was not changed by either condition, so intermittent fasting or normal dieting. And why that's interesting is because a lot of people, of course, end up also implying that with intermittent fasting, you're going to see decreases in your metabolic rate. Uh, that does not seem to be the case, at least not after eight weeks, which again, this would probably be another one that might fall under, well, the eight weeks wasn't long enough. I would venture to say maybe something along more like 24 or maybe even 32 weeks or even a whole year before you would actually see maybe some effects. And even that I, I, I sort of doubt. So as a matter of fact, I strongly doubt it. So, but at least based off of this data, metabolism was unaffected negatively or positively by intermittent fasting. So now let's discuss a little bit on the mechanisms. I'm going to go into a bit of molecular biology here. Uh, so certainly bear with me as always, but uh, also keep in mind that this is just what the researchers are, are, are putting forward. Uh, and I will give an alternative perspective uh, that I think is probably far more likely. So you know how I mentioned adiponectin? adiponectin being that hormone that's released from the fat cells, and then it binds other cells and then it enacts its particular role on those cells. Well, adiponectin is known to be an ins to uh, sensitize cells to insulin so that then you need less insulin to uh, enact its role. And that's a positive because then you get more blood sugar removed out of the bloodstream uh, for per molecule of insulin that's bound to the cells. Great. However, the other thing that they mention because they, they mentioned that body weight did not change between uh, the, or I'm sorry, the body weight did decrease for the intermittent fasting group and body fat decreased for the, for the intermittent fasting group. But yet, how do they explain that um, if they were consuming the same amount of calories and or the same amount of energy intake and just roughly had no real big differences between their diets, except for, of course, the fact of the timing of, of their diets and whatnot. So they thought that maybe that body fat loss was due to adiponectin. So adiponectin actually binding, let me throw up this graphic, uh, adiponectin binding to its receptor on the cell membrane and then from there, the adiponectin receptor would then lead to a greater activation of a downstream molecule, a master molecule known as AMPK. And AMPK has all kinds of far-reaching effects. But uh, so, so please excuse this, this highly, highly uh, simplified graphic that I created. But ultimately, AMPK then would activate another protein, another molecule downstream called PGC1-alpha. Now, I've definitely discussed PGC1-alpha in the, in the past, but PGC1-alpha is implicated in the generation of more mitochondria. So, uh, 
AMPK, the thought process here is that once adiponectin binds its receptor, the receptor will then go through uh, conformational changes. And for any molecular biologists out there, I think it's a GPCR. So it's, it goes through a G coupled protein uh, receptor. And from there, you get the activation of AMPK through some downstream molecules. And then once AMPK is active, then it phosphorylates PGC1-alpha, meaning that it tags PGC1-alpha to be active. And then that PGC1-alpha will then lead to ultimately the reading of more genes that are responsible for the production of more mitochondrial proteins. So as a result, then you have more mitochondria. And what would that then imply that would imply that you would have a greater fatty acid metabolism so you'd be able to oxidize you'd be able to use more fat molecules as a result and this might make some sense because other data that i didn't actually present it looked at the what's called the respiratory exchange ratio of these uh, these individuals and what that tells you is is their body using more carbohydrates or is it using more body is it using more fat i should say just fat nutrient uh, or molecules and they found that with the intermittent fasting group that they had a slight movement more towards fat oxidation so fat use so this whole idea would fall in line with that line of evidence that you see increases in mitochondria therefore you see increases in fatty acid fat molecule oxidation or use for energy. Okay, so maybe that would be an explanation as to why you see changes in body fat. Okay, now I'm going to circle back to that in just a little bit, but what I'd also like to cover is the effects on inflammation. So kind of the mechanism for what they were thinking in what was actually leading to this betterment in insulin sensitivity or this better this reduction in insulin right and reduction in blood sugar roughly when looking at the intermittent fasting group how could they explain that and how do they relate that to reductions in the those inflammatory markers so let me go ahead and explain this graphic and if you're listening to the podcast again as always don't don't worry unless i'm doing a terrible job explaining it every time then please do worry and please let me know that i'm doing a terrible job so i can uh, and give me some tips on how i can improve so i can I, I could be a little more uh a little more descriptive when when certain things are on the screen for for those of you that are that are just listening okay so in this example you have one of these these inflammatory markers that's a cytokine. That's uh, the the interleukin six that I mentioned earlier. Tumor necrosis factor. Essentially, these are things that are released by cells, and they typically either recruit uh, inflammatory immune cells, or they can uh, push away or kind of uh, move away. Uh, inflammatory immune cells, or they can change the profile of immune cells, or they can change cells, the, the signaling inside of just regular cells that are non-immune related. And that's actually what we're talking about in this situation, that you have a molecule like tumor necrosis factor, some sort of inflammatory cytokine, and it binds its receptor on the cell, let's say the muscle cell, for example, it can be any any cell that has the receptor. And then from there, you have changes in that receptor, that inflammatory cytokine receptor, and that leads to ultimately a activation of a complex known as IKK. So it's, it's technically called the I-kappa B uh, complex. And this IKK uh, molecule protein has two different functions. Well, it has a lot of functions, but we're gonna be focusing on two different functions. And I'll cover the one in just a second, but the first one that we're interested in is its effect on insulin signaling. So typically what would happen is if insulin is out in the bloodstream and it binds to its insulin receptor on the cell, then you have the recruitment of what's called an insulin receptor substrate, an IRS. So this protein, this IRS protein, will bind to the insulin receptor and will allow other molecules that are implicated in this blood sugar regulation system mechanism. They will all kind of get recruited together and they will start activating one another. And once 
particular ones are activated. We're talking like uh, uh, PI3, you're talking AKT, we're talking AS160, you know, all these different proteins. You don't actually need to know what those are. I'm just sort of talking for anybody that, that does know what those molecules are. Ultimately, you get the greater entrance of blood sugar from outside in the bloodstream into the cells themselves, therefore reducing blood sugar levels. So that's the idea that through insulin binding the insulin receptor, insulin receptor then activates IRS, this protein within the cell, and then IRS will then activate a series of other proteins that will allow blood sugar to move from the bloodstream into the cell, therefore dropping blood sugar. Great. However, if we go back to IKK, what happens is IKK actually phosphorylates or tags IRS. So that same protein that insulin tries to work through. And what, when, once it's phosphorylated, where it's phosphorylated, and that's important for anybody that's, that thinks that phosphorylation is all the same, it's not. It, it also de depends where it's phosphorylated. So a phosphate group is attached to IRS and it's tagged then that IRS actually becomes inhibited. And not only that, it also gets degraded. So it gets destroyed. Um, so if you have less of this IRS, then you're going to have less insulin signaling. So you're going to, you're going to have less insulin sensitivity of that cell. So you would then need more of these receptors and you would need more insulin in general. So the idea there is that these inflammatory markers will increase IKK presence and activity and therefore decrease IRS. And then if you have decreases in IRS, you have reduced insulin sensitivity. And that's why you see these typically decreases in inflammatory markers. And you also see a concomitant decrease in insulin because you don't need as much because you are more insulin sensitive if you have less of these inflammatory markers. These are all based on a lot of other studies than just what's explained here, but this is what some of the, the, the researchers of the study kind of point out. Now, that's the first thing that IKK does. The second thing that it does, however, is it actually feedbacks. So it, it feeds back onto creating more inflammatory signals. And how it does that is it actually also phosphorylates, just like it phosphorylates IRS for destruction, it also phosphorylates a co another complex of proteins um, and because it phosphorylates this complex of proteins which one of those proteins is called i kappa b or i kappa beta and i kappa beta actually holds on to two other proteins that are made up that make up another complex known as nf kappa b so let me back that up real quick, just just so I can, you know, so you're not looking at me like, what? <laughs> you have three proteins, and they're all stuck together. They make a complex of proteins. They make a grouping of proteins, those three proteins. One of them is called I kappa beta. The other two grouped together are called NF kappa beta, or NF kappa B. Now, IKK puts slaps a tag on I kappa beta and that dissociates that removes I K I K I kappa beta, excuse me, from the NF kappa B proteins. And then that I kappa beta gets degraded. It gets removed. Now NF kappa B is now free as it's two protein complex to move into the nucleus, bind Infl inflammation genes, it doesn't just do that, but th that's one of the chief targets, inflammation genes and allows for the production of more inflammatory cytokines, which are the same ones that allowed for the activation of IKK. Remember, tumor necrosis factor, interleukin-6, etc., etc. So the cell is essentially feedbacking on itself and just producing more of these inflammatory uh, cytokines. So you need some sort of an interruption of that process. And so that's all the bad stuff, right? That's, you know, more inflammation leads to more IKK, more IKK reduces IRS, you have less insulin signaling, but IKK also increases the signaling through NF kappa B, which then leads to more infl inflammatory uh, uh, signals. Okay, adiponectin comes in here, I didn't show this on the graph, but adiponectin inhibits this whole process. 
So not only does it potentially lead to increases in PGC1-alpha and increases in mitochondrial production, but it can also inhibit this whole inflammatory process, therefore leading to better insulin sensitivity because you're inhibiting that entire inflammatory uh, system. Hopefully that made sense. I really hope it did, uh, especially if you're listening. I really hope it did because it's a, it's a lot. You know, it, once you get into molecular biology, you're trying to explain the cell signaling and all that. It gets it gets in the weeds, and I'm definitely simplifying things. So don't at me if you are a molecular biologist. I'm well aware that uh, there's more more to this than what I'm explaining. Uh, I just uh, I just don't want to have people's eyes glaze over too too much. Okay, so those are the two mechanisms that I mentioned that I was going to go over. Now, the final thing is real simple, and it's my explanation for, for, for why we're seeing some of the effects that we're seeing, which isn't necessarily discounting all the mechanisms that I just went over. But uh, they said that the, they, the researchers even admitted that uh, there may have been some recall issues, meaning that re dietary recall may have been off. So... If that's the case, then that means that it's potential that one group, let's just say the intermittent fasting group, uh, may have underreported how much they were actually consuming. Maybe they weren't weighing correctly. Maybe they uh, they just weren't quite aware. Maybe you know it's just like enough errors kind of accrued, or they just didn't report as much as they thought that did it that they they actually consumed, and ultimately that then leads to a misrepresentation of what they actually consumed. And that's certainly possible because if a person is used to consuming throughout the entire day and then they, uh, for those eight weeks, now they're only consuming for seven or eight hours in, in the day, they might really feel stuffed by the end of those eight hours. So uh, it's possible that, that these people weren't necessarily consuming as much as they were prescribed to, to be consuming. So if that's the case, then they would see weight loss and they would see uh, body fat loss as a result. Now that's a really simplistic understanding, but sometimes the simplest uh, explanation is the correct explanation. Now that doesn't mean that adiponectin doesn't increase. Actually with weight loss and body fat loss, you do typically see increases in adiponectin. And why I think that it may be more likely that it's due to some issues with dietary recall is because you see decreases in leptin, for example. You saw decreases in leptin, which you don't, you, that's an energy sensor. So literally, like if you if you are consistently under consuming, your leptin levels start to decrease. Uh, so it is a proxy energy sensor. Another thing is reductions in testosterone. Other studies have also shown that healthy, especially active individuals that are in a caloric deficit, eventually you will see decreases in testosterone. I've covered that in depth before. Uh, IGF-1 being another thing that decreased. So you've got a lot of kind of proxy clues here that are showing that yes, it's possible that these people underreported and they were in a slight caloric deficit. Not extreme, obviously, because they didn't lose a ton of body fat, but they lost a little bit. And then if that's the case, then I think in certain ways it's actually even more encouraging because it's possible then that intermittent fasting not only is really beneficial for kind of a uh, an unplanned uh, weight loss, an unplanned fat loss, but you also see a maintenance of muscle mass even though and muscle strength even though you're in a caloric deficit. Now, all of this stuff would have to actually be confirmed. We can't jump to those conclusions off of the data that we have here. But still, if it turns out to be true, that would be phenomenal. That'd be really great. So, and then you do see increases in like adiponectin. You do see increases in PGC1-alpha and all these different things, which of course, all that stuff was, was pretty speculative on their part. They were just kind of offering, spitballing some possible uh, reasons as to why you saw body fat loss and why you saw uh, decreases in insulin and blood sugar and all, all that. Okay, but I'm going to stop talking. Let me jump to the conclusions, the takeaways from this, and then uh, we can, we can uh, end this. Uh, so the conclusion is that muscle mass and strength is maintained by intermittent fasting paired with resistance training. That's important. Uh, intermittent fasting also led to mild fat loss. Uh, intermittent fasting also changes particular fat hormones. We talked about adiponectin, leptin, leptin going down, adiponectin going up. 
uh, like a decrease in leptin, uh, reading off my notes here, uh, and an increase in adip adiponectin while also reducing circulating insulin and blood sugar levels. So this would then imply potentially greater insulin sensitivity, although they probably should have done some measures specifically for that. There were no changes in resting metabolism either. Finally, it also reduces a variety of inflammatory markers like TNF-alpha and interleukin-6. Now, if that is independent or dependent on uh, caloric restriction, we don't know. Uh, so we'll just, have to, we'll just have to take it as it is and just say that these people were uh, got all of these benefits from an intermittent fasting diet while still implementing a similar resistance training protocol to the other group. So there you have it, folks. Some pretty great news, definitely uh, good, good information related to uh, how intermittent fasting, a really mild intermittent fasting too, just 16-8, right? 16 hours fasting and eight hours uh, consumption. Not bad. And not trying to lose weight, but uh, potentially still losing body fat. Uh, so really, really interesting here. Okay. With that, uh, I hope you found it as interesting and useful as I did, and I hope to have the pleasure of speaking with you in the future. Have a good one, guys. See ya.